Red Brick Media. All quality CDs, DVDs, lectures, khutbah, conferences and Quran recitations. All revenue generated supports our Dawa work, supported by visiting our store. You can now purchase directly from our site www.redbrickmedia.co.uk أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار In the Quran, there are a number of ayat that Allah Ta'ala mentions that when people come Yawm Al-Qiyamah they will not be in a position to blame the shaitan if they find themselves on the wrong side of the trap if the person is raised up and he finds himself with the Hizb al-Shaitan with the Ashab al-Nar with the maghdubi alayhim, with the dalim, he's going to be in the hellfire, he won't be able to look at shaitan and say, it's your fault. Those ayahs said that shaitan said, فَلَا تُلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't blame me. Blame yourselves. And one of the reasons for that is, everyone who has intellect, he has the ability in this religion to know what to do and what not to do and how to do it and how not to do it. The religion is clear. So if a person comes and he finds himself destroyed, Yom al in trouble, it's not because the religion didn't make things clear. It's because something happened where he didn't do his part. He didn't do his job. Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran, لِيَهْلِكَ مَنْ هَلَكَ أَنْبَيِّنَةً وَيَحْيَا مَنْ حَيَّ أَنْبَيِّنَةً So that the one who is destroyed, he's going to be destroyed based upon clear evidences. And the one who has lived, he's living, he's successful. Yom al he was successful because of clear evidences. He took his religion. So the deen of Allah, as we mentioned a number of times, and as everybody knows, it has made everything clear. We explained everything in the Quran, from the mundane affairs to the big affairs. The affairs connected to Allah, who he is, and so forth and so on. His names and characteristics. From what Islam has explained to us clearly is how to love people in this dunya. And the person who doesn't love, he's not living life. There's a problem. The one who's not loving and he's not being loved, there's a problem with the quality of his life. So Islam told us, Quran and Sunnah, how to love our wives, our children, our friends, and how to hate. There's a love that is religious and there is a love that's irreligious. So when it comes to loving the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Quran, the authentic Sunnah, explained to us clearly, this love is acceptable. This love is mandatory. This love right here is haram. Allah doesn't want it, and His Rasul doesn't want it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. An example of those ayat, what happened to the people before us. Allah mentioned, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, لا تغلو في دينكم ولا تقولوا على الله إلا الحق إنما المسيح عيسى بن مريم رسول الله وكلمته ألقاها إلى مريم وروح منه فآمنوا بالله ورسوله ولا تقولوا ثلاثة انتهوا خير لكم Hey أهل الكتاب Don't go overboard and be excessive in your love Don't go overboard and have غلو and Isa ibn Maryam. For verily he was only Rasulullah and he was the kalima from Allah that was given to Maryam when he said to Maryam, be, and she became pregnant. 
and he is the ruh or the spirit from Allah. So therefore, Ahlul Kitab, believe in Allah and believe in all of his prophets and all of his messengers and stop saying three. Stop saying the Trinity. Stop saying that he is one of three. This ayat of the Quran is an ayat for the Muslims to know. Ahlul Kitab went overboard in their love for Isa ibn Maryam. And as a result of that, they said he was the son of Allah. As a result of that, they came up with the 25th as being his birthday. As a result of that, they came up with East as being the day he rose from the dead. As a result of that, all of the catalog of offenses that they make that are contrary to what Isa ibn Maryam brought, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. So in our religion, we don't go overboard in the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We love him, and it is wajib for everybody to love him, as I'm going to explain to you, inshallah. But before doing so, let's just take a look at one of the enemies of al-Islam during the time of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who had absolutely no love for the Nabi. He had absolutely no love. He was similar to Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl in his hatred and disdain for the Nabi. But look at how he observed how the companions loved the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His name is Urwa Thaqafi. When he went to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from Quraysh, from Mecca, in the sulh of al Hudaybiyah, to have a discussion and a negotiation about some issues. Can the Nabi come to Mecca this year or not? He went back to the Kufab Quraysh after the discussion and during the course of the discussion that took quite a bit of time, he saw the companions and how they were with the Nabi. So when he went back with the agreement that he made, he said to Quraysh, he said, listen to me. He said, Wallahi, I have met and I have represented some of the great leaders of today. I met the Caesar of Rome during that time. I met the Kisra of Persia during that time. I met the king of Ethiopia, the Najashi. I met all of them, and I saw all of them, and I saw their people. He said, Wallahi, I never saw any of their followers loving them, respecting them, venerating them, the way I saw Muhammad's companions doing with him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They said, what do you mean, Arwa? He said, what I mean is, whenever he was spit, the spit, spittle, it wouldn't hit the earth except one of them would catch it and he would wipe it on his hands and wipe it on his face. He would make wudu and after making wudu I saw that they used to compete with each other in a physical way to catch the water before it fell on the floor and they would wipe themselves with the water of his wudu. He said if any of them came in my presence and spoke to him, they would speak to him in a low voice. That was barely audible for someone to hear other than the Nabi. They said when they came in his presence, they would not look at him in his eyes. They would look at the ground and talk to him with respect. And then he mentioned number five. He said, I saw if he told them to do something, they were quick in executing what his command was. He mentioned those five things. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. All five of them are indications of the love that they have for the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in each one there is a khutbah but to make the ikhtisar for those Muslims who go overboard in the athar and the relics of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we believe, I believe other Muslims here who I speak on their behalf, we believe that you can do a tabarruk with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his spit is barakah now the non-Muslim who hears me say this, the ones who look at our statements, the ones who want to take Islam out of context, they would say this guy is calling his community and encouraging the community to venerate the spit of people and to take bath and to bathe themselves in spit. I don't say that. And the Nabi of Al-Islam, Isa ibn Maryam, when he comes back, if a prophet were to spit and you were to take that spit, that spit be in Allah can put barakah in the eyesight of an individual. The wound that he has, that barakah, because he's not a normal human being, it can give shifa be in Allah. So we believe in the tabarru. There are some narrations that some of the companions, like Abdullah ibn Zubair, after the Nabi did some cupping and he took 
the blood out of himself, he told him, get rid of the blood. The narration said that Abdullah ibn Zubair went away, not in front of the Nabi, and he consumed and he drank the blood. Some of the ulama say this is not authentic, and that's what seems to be the case. Not authentic, but if it is authentic, and it was authentic, he drank the blood of someone who revelation comes to him, but it's not authentic and drinking blood is not permissible, and the Nabi never told him to drink the blood. But if it is authentic, it's the example of the companion getting tabarrak from the blood of the Nabi, and the scholar said it's not authentic. The lady, Um Ayman, the Nabi was in her house, and instead of getting up and going out of the house to relieve himself, he would urinate in a wooden vessel, and he would leave it there. The lady came, not knowing what was in there, and she was thirsty, and she drank it, not knowing. The Nabi didn't know that, she told, he told her, take that bowl and throw it away. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I drank it last night. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then nothing will ever hurt your stomach. Some of the ulama of Islam said it's authentic. It seems to be unauthentic. The story is authentic, but the authentic story doesn't mention she drank the urine, akramakum Allah. But if she did drink the urine, she drank the urine of someone that revelation comes to him, and I'm not saying she drank it. The point is, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Isa ibn Maryam, if you drink their urine, and Islam didn't tell you to do it, because urine is najasa, it is an impurity. Whether it comes from Muhammad or other than Muhammad, it's an impurity. It's something that happens inside of the body of Bani Adam that should be discarded. The point is, getting a tabarruk, is a part of loving the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. So if in fact someone really had a relic of his, nothing wrong with honoring, honoring, commemorating it, looking at it being something big. Abdullah Amr ibn al-As, when the man said, when they used to look at him, they would put their heads down. Amr ibn al-As told the tabi'een, like us, we're people who never saw the Nabi, the tabi'een never saw the Nabi, Amr ibn al-Az told those people, if any of you were to ask me, describe to you how he looked. How was his lihya? How did his ears look? How were his eyes, his forehead? If you were to ask me, you want to make a sketch and a drawing, what did he look like? He said, I would not be able to tell you because I didn't look in his face. We used to not look at him like that. Out of respect, we would talk to him and we would put our heads down and we would talk to him that way. Showing the love that's permissible. My father was a non-Muslim, my grandfather was a non-Muslim. I sit there and out of love and respect for them, I put my head down, I don't look my father in the eye. That's part of the culture of many Africans today. Muslims and non-Muslims, the elders, you don't look at them in the face. Islam didn't tell you that's how you have to be, but that's how the companions were with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. There was a companion, Ikhwani, concerning the statement of Urwa al-Thaqafi, how he saw the companions with the Nabi and he was a kafir. The companion, his name is Thabit ibn Qais. Surah of the Quran al-Hujurat was revealed, and in the surah Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned, La tarfa'u aswatukum fawqa sawtin Nabi. Hey, you people who believe, don't raise your voices above the voice of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After the ayat was read to the community, that man went missing. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from his sunnah, everybody in the masjid, he knew your name, he knew your children's name, he knew your situation, where you lived and what was your job. Not because revelation, no. Because you came to him with an issue, the young man came to him with an issue, this one came to him with an issue, you got sick and he went to visit you, he knew everybody's name. I don't even know everybody in the first row name here, because I didn't see some of the people. The Nabi knew everybody's name from the community, and what's his situation? So his sunnah was, if a Sheikh Abu Muhammad went missing, la samahallah, he stopped coming to the masjid. This man sits in that chair every week. He went missing. Something is wrong. The Nabi will ask the people, anybody see a Sheikh Abu Muhammad? Ya Rasulullah, we don't know where he was. We don't know where he is. The Nabi said, you go to the house of the Sheikh and see what's the situation. That's what happened. Thabit ibn Qais went missing. Just a regular man. He wasn't a regular man. He was the khatib of the Ansar. 
He was the one who was known as being an orator. He was the one who had a strong voice. So he used to be the one who would speak on their behalf. He didn't have a microphone. He would speak on their behalf and the people could hear him back there. That was the voice that Allah gave him just as Allah gave Bilal the voice to make the adhan out loud. Go, you, go and find out what's his news. He went, he said, yeah, Thabit, the Nabi wants to know what's your situation. You haven't been coming around. Thabit said, you didn't hear the ayat that was revealed. You didn't hear the surah that was revealed. What surah? Allah said, don't raise your voices above the voice of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because if you do that, it will render your deeds null and void. Your salah, your zakat, all the efforts that you made will be nothing. The man said, you know that I have a loud voice, so I'm naturally talking and I'm raising my voice over the Nabi. So I have been destroyed by that ayat. That's the man's sensitivities. That's how the man feels. The Rasul of Rasulullah went back to him and told him the story. The Nabi told him, go back to Thab and say to him, the ayat isn't talking about him. The ayat isn't talking about Bilal making a, a loud adhan. That ayat is not talking about these two people. That ayat is talking about other people. Tell him he's from the Ashab al-Jannah. He's from the people of Jannah. So when Urwa al-Thaqaf, he said, if one of them spoke, he lowered his voice. That was the love that they had for the Nabi, the respect that they had for the Nabi. The one who raises his voice over the Nabi is not Thabit, is not Bilal, is not the Sheikh in the Haram in Mecca or Medina in Beit al-Maqdis who's talking with a microphone. It's not him. It's the individual who the Hadith comes to him. And the Hadith says to him, you can wipe over these socks that are on my feet right now. You can wipe over your hoofs, even if they're old and raggedy and they have holes in them. And the person says, no, I'm not going to take that because my imam and my madhab didn't say it. That's raising your voice over the Nebi. In these days where the, the snow has come down and there's ice all over the place, people are slipping, breaking their hips, breaking their bones. In Al-Islam, we can combine between Zuhur and Asr. We can combine between the Maghrib and Isha, and then the person doesn't have to come to the masjid. There is proof for that. We tell the people, hey, combine, combine, Zuhur and Asr. Maghrib and Isha, make it easy for the people. The person says, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? It's not my culture. It's not my madhab. It's not what we do. That's the one who's raising his voice over the voice of the Nabi. My mother said, my culture said, my imam said, he's the one who's doing that. The one who has drama with his relatives. Mother, father, husband, wife. We have to make peace with people. That's just, that's just how it goes. That's the hard, cold fact. Loving the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is overlooking these problems because the Nabi told us to do it. Bringing yourself down because he told you to do it. That's the way we love him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the point here, ikhwani, loving Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not what these kuffar have designed in the way that they think. Your mother, my mother gave birth to us and we're going to choose one day, Mother's Day, to show her that she's honored, respected and loved. No one does that except something is wrong with the way he thinks. Every single day, the mother deserves to be honored. But in our religion, there, is, there are special days where you can honor her above the regular days, every day she's honored. But you can choose a special day, not Mother's Day because the Kofar said it, and give them money because of that. But the special day I'm going to honor my mother, the day of the eight. I'm gonna honor my mother on Friday. I'm gonna honor my mother when I have a baby. I'm gonna honor my mother in the special days of El Islam. As for waiting for one day every year, and that's when I'm gonna make her feel special. And if it's the case with our mothers, what do you think the case is with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam? That we're going to wait until the 12th of Rabi al-Awwal yesterday, today, and this is the day where we're going to honor him. We're going to honor him every single day throughout the course of the year by saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, especially on Friday, we're going to honor him and that we're going to fast every Monday of our lives. We're going to fast the majority of the Mondays in the month because it was his sunnah. Why are you fasting on this day, Monday? Because I was born on this day. So you want to honor him? Just fast on Monday, every Monday. 
It's something that's ordained, legislated, something that Allah loves, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ummat al-Islam, loving the Nabi is from the awjab al-wajibat. It is fard, fard al -ain on everybody here. You have to do it. And it has its virtues. The Nabi told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the very famous hadith, la yu'minu ahaduko hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min walidihi wa walidihi wa nasi ajma'in. None of you truly believes until I become more beloved to you than your children, your father, your mother, and your father, and all of the people. He was holding the hand of Umar radiallahu anhu, showing love and affection. Love and affection. I'm not comfortable. Abu Usama, the individual, I'm not comfortable with holding men's hands. I'm not comfortable. During the time of the Nabi, out of love, honor, and respect, he held the hands of his companions. He told them, I love you. They told him, we love you. So part of showing our love for him is, in this society, men don't tend to want to touch each other. You go to the barber, you want that barber, hey man, back up. Don't be on me like that. Just cut my hair and back up. But in Al-Islam, in showing my love and affection for people, for my brothers, from what the Sunnah is, you hold his hand, you touch him, you hug him. That's from the love of the Nabi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned about this issue or the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thalathun man kunna fihi wajada halawatan iman an yakun Allah wa rasulu ahabba ilayhi mimma siwa hima three things whoever has them he will taste the sweetness of iman that he loves Allah and his messenger more than everything else more than anything and everything else. When the Nabi told the people, none of you truly believes until I become more beloved to you, he was holding Umar's hands. Umar said, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than everybody. Hafsa ibn Umar, my mother, my father, Abu Bakr Umar, I love you more than everybody. Uthman, Ali, everybody. But I love myself more. I love myself more than anybody else. I'm Ahrats al Nas, I'm what benefits me. The Nabi told him, Umar, you're not a true believer. You're not a complete believer. He said, okay, if that's the case, then I love you even more than myself. Then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tell him, now you're a believer because Allah mentioned in the Quran, and Nabi you awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. He's closer to the believers than their own selves. So, ikhwani fillahi, loving the Nabi is from our deen, it's wajib, but there's a way of loving, and there's a way of not loving. The way of loving, is following him as Urwa al-Thaqafi saw from the companions. So the way we love him, and remember these two words, al-Ittiba and al-I'tisam. Al-Ittiba is following his sunnah. When the hadith comes to you, you do your best to do it as many times as possible and to follow it. And if you can't do it, no problem, just don't be against it. Urwa said, when he told them to do something, they got up and they did it. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say to a sheikh, Abu Muhammad with the white beard, hey, you, go over there and fetch me some water. He would not look to his right. He wouldn't look to his left. He wouldn't say to his son, didn't you hear the Rasul? His son himself would want to make things easy for his father because they respected their fathers due to what the Nabi told him about the position of the father. The son wants to do it, but the son knew that the Nabi told him. The man would go all the way over there and fetch the water, climb the tree, would do whatever the Nabi told him. al ittiba say, if you love Allah, then follow me. Allah will forgive you for your sins. He'll forgive you for your sins and he'll love you. It's in following him. And al ittisam al ittiba al ittisam al ittisam means following those companions. Following his sunnah, the way those companions follow. I tell you, Khwani, there are some people who claim a love for the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they don't love the Nabi because they hate the companions. The Nabi said about the Ansar Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ayatul Iman, Hubbul Ansar, Wa Ayatul Nifaq, Bughdul Ansar, a sign that a person is a mu'min. He has love for the Ansar. He sits there and he loves the Ansar. The sign that he's a kafir, munafiq, fake in Islam, is that he hates the Ansar. 
in al-Islam, the Ansar have a position. And the Muhajireen from Mecca are higher than the Ansar. So if you love the Ansar, Allah loves you. And if you love the Ansar, you have to love the Muhajireen because all of them are better than the Ansar. If you hate the Ansar, Allah hates you. If you hate the Ansar, then you're going to hate the Muhajireen as well. And the Muhajireen are better than the Ansar. The people, the people who hate the companions, I don't care how much they scream and shout and jump up and down and cut themselves. They don't love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the nas or the text of the hadith. Ikhwani, I need you to concentrate on this point and not misunderstand what I'm about to tell you right now. In Greek mythology, Greek mythology, it's not even real. Zeus and those guys, it's not even real. It's kofr and shirk. There's a famous story that has become a parable in our language. And that story is the story of being conscious, aware of accepting a gift from a Greek who's bearing presence. The cliche, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Some people say it comes from that story. It's not even real. The Greeks wanted to conquer the city of Troy. They couldn't get through the big wall. So they said, let's make a big horse out of wood and we're gonna put the men inside of the horse and then we leave it as a gift. When we go away, they bring the horse inside of the fortress, close the door. When they go to sleep, the people inside of the horse from our soldiers get out and kill everyone and open up the door. It's not even real. It's kofar is shirk. It's a fable, a fairy tale. They did that. They made a big horse out of wood. They left, the people opened the door, they brought the gift in. Our enemies left us a gift. And then when they went to sleep, the men jumped out of the horse and killed everybody and opened up the door and they took over the city. That story, that story, that story, that kofr shik story, the molid of the Nabi is more harmful on this community and the Muslims than that kofr shik story. The molid of the Nabi. Someone will hear this and say, that guy is crazy. That guy has lost his mind. That guy hates the Nabi to that degree. The shirk of that story is less harmful because everybody in his right mind, he knows that that's just a fairy tale. He knows historically it's not even true. A big horse with so many men in it, the people didn't hear the men moving around. Why are your enemies going to leave you a horse and leave you a gift? No one's going to believe that. The people who introduced to us the molid of the Nabi are the people who cursed the companions. They're khubatha and they have khubth. They didn't mean any good for this ummah by giving us the molid of the Nabi. They hate the Ansar, they hate the Muhajireen, and your Nabi who we love says, whoever hates the Ansar, Allah hates him. Whoever loves the Ansar, Allah loves him. So how in the world, with proper intellect, can a Muslim, by any stretch of his imagination, believe that the people who hate the companions are going to give you a wooden horse, a gift that you can benefit from? It is a gift that is dirty and nasty. It's a gift that because of it, Yawm Al-Qiyamah, many people who think that they love the Nabi, the Prophet will throw away that love and free himself from that love. In Islam, in Islam, look what happened during the time of the Nabi. There was a man by the name of Abdullah. The companions called him Donkey, Himar. His name was Abdullah, the most beloved name to Allah. But they nicknamed him Donkey. He didn't mind. He was a jokester, a prankster. He used to make the Nabi laugh. The man used to drink khamar, radiallahu anhu. And many times he was brought to the Nabi and he was flogged in front of the people in public and they knew that he used to drink khamar. But the Nabi would laugh at different things that he did. One time he was brought, after becoming drunk, the Nabi flogged that man in front of the people. Someone said, hey, man, you come here all the time. You get brought here so many times. May Allah curse you. The Nabi said, hey, 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 la talanhu, fa inni alam and nuhu yuhibbullaha wa rasuluhu. Don't curse that man. I know that he loves Allah and his messenger. So the Muslim lady may not wear hijab. Our youngsters selling drugs, getting high, hanging out. The Muslim may make mistakes in his life, but he still can love Allah and his messenger. 
Just because he never makes sunnah doesn't mean he doesn't love Allah. His he makes a mistake, doesn't mean it. Committed zina, she committed zina, abortion, doesn't mean it. They committed sins. But if a person goes against the fundamentals of Islam, like our relatives, like the Shiite, people who say that the Nabi is like Allah, people who say that he never died, people who make dua to him, people who go overboard, the fundamentals of Islam, we're not talking about just a mistake or a sin, we're talking about what is counter to the religion, shirk and kufr, innovations and things like that. You, and you can scream all you want, put all of the, 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 the lights in the window. When you go against the, these usul, it's as if the person is saying clearly, I don't love the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because I'm putting him on par with Allah. And in some instances, I put him above Allah. If the man says to you with certain Muslims, wallahi, wallahi, you may take it with a grain of salt. But if he says, wa nabi, I swear by the nabi, you know he's telling the truth. You know he's telling the truth. Because Allah is lesser. The love he has for the Nabi, the Prophet, is more, more, more in his religion. The man came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, when is Yawm Al-Qiyamah? When is Yawm Al-Qiyamah? He said, what did you prepare for Yawm Al-Qiyamah? He said, I didn't make a lot of salat. I didn't fast a lot. I didn't make zakat. I didn't make hajj. I didn't do a lot. But wallahi, I love Allah and I love you. The Nabi said, Al-Mar'u Ma'man Ahab. The person will be with the one that he loves. So the person didn't make a lot of sunnah. They didn't go and do the extra stuff. But they still can be of those who love Allah. And his messenger, the man upon hearing that, he said, the companion said, when we heard that, we were so happy on that day. They said, they said, the man said, if that's the case, I love you, and I love Abu Bakr, and I love Umar. They love the companions. Loving the Nabi and his companions. People don't love the companions, they don't love the Nabi. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ونسأل الله تعالى التوفيق والسداد. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. إخواني، I know it past one o'clock. I just need two minutes to deal with a small, easy shubahat that some of the Muslims have concerning this issue with the Nabi, and it's simple. And there are many shubahat, but the one we'll deal with right now for two minutes, bi idhnillah, only Allah can give us these two minutes, not the Nabi, only Allah can give us one minute, two minutes, 30 seconds, not the Nabi. Some people come and say, but in Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, they celebrate the birthday of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. In Saudi Arabia, in Saudi Arabia, you people, Alul Hadith, you people, and Salafi people, you people, you people, you love Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. You respect Saudi Arabia and the ulama of Saudi Arabia. In Saudi Arabia, they celebrate 100 years of their kingdom. In Saudi Arabia, they celebrate the king's birthday. In Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, and the issue is so easy. Saudi Arabia is not our religion. Saudi Arabia does some things that are okay. Saudi Arabia does some things that are not okay. The scholars of Saudi Arabia are the Ras Walain. We love, we respect them, but our religion is not the scholar of Saudi Arabia said. A Sheikh ibn Baz said it was permissible to do Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab day. If he said that, I don't agree with him. In our masjid right here, in the winter conference, a Sheikh from Saudi Arabia came and he talked about Adam's two sons, one killing the other, and he said one killed the other one because he wanted to marry his sister who was white and beautiful but he had to marry the sister who was black and ugly. We say, hey, Sheikh, Sheikh, we don't accept that. We don't accept that because there's no delil for that. No delil, black and ugly. Besides, everybody knows black is beautiful. Nobody accepts that. You have to bring the delil for that. And they didn't have racism during that time. Are we gonna say Saudi Arabia must be true? We're not gonna say that. Even if Ibn Baz said it, or Ibn Baz, our religion is, Allah said and his messenger said, we're not those kind of people. If Saudi Arabia do something, that's the delil. And we're not those people who use Saudi Arabia when it's for them, and they're against Saudi Arabia when it's not for them. Yeah, but they do 20 rakats in Saudi Arabia, now you're using them. They don't pray with their shoes in Saudi Arabia, now you're using them. So let everybody know, the birthday of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab can't celebrate it in Islam. The birthday of the king of Saudi Arabia can't celebrate it in Islam. 
the birthday of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can't celebrate in Islam. If anyone's birthday could be celebrated, it was the Nabi. It is the Nabi. And that's not permissible. The way we commemorate it is we fast on Monday. We say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We name our children after him. We defend his sunnah. We try to expose the people to the sunnah. Those kuffar start coming and they talk bad about him. We defend him, salawatullahi wa salam wa ali. We ask Allah Ta'ala to put us in the Jannah til firdaus and to make us recipients of the shifa of al Mustafa al Mukhtar al Mujtaba. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to make all of us from the Ansar al Sunnah, those people who love the Nabi with moderation and the proper way, the way that the companions were upon it. Aqam al Salat, Yarhamakumullah, Ajma'in. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan r-rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim